Do you believe in the Loch Ness Monster? Probably not nowadays, but back in the 20th century, practically everybody did. We never had evidence of the Loch Ness Monster, just a blurry photograph that turned out to be a cheap hoax. The myth didn't die. Since the 1970s, people have scanned and dredged the lake with expensive equipment to look for a monster they had no reason to believe in. They had so much hope, so much faith, wasted a whole bunch of resources, and probably didn't do the fish any favors either. And yet, the myth is still alive. We know the photo was faked, we know there was no monster in the loch, yet some people still believe. Beliefs die hard. We should have treated the Loch Ness Monster like we treat unicorns. We don't have any evidence unicorns ever existed either. We think of it as a cute, enduring myth, but only a myth. Not something that probably once existed, just something we made up. Children believe in unicorns because they're presented with the idea of unicorns in fiction and don't really have a reason to doubt it. The idea isn't ridiculous in theory. Horses could have evolved horns. Until we get older and someone disabuses us of the idea, unicorns are just part of our world, like dinosaurs. You don't have to have seen dinosaurs in the flesh to believe in them. You just need to have been reliably informed they once existed. And that brings us to the rest of the phenomena in the title of this video. If you can measure, by any criteria, how good or bad someone is, it would make sense to assume that in theory there should be good cops, landlords, bureaucrats, politicians, and people of any group. However, to think of good cops and bad cops, or good landlords and bad landlords, is to ignore that the nature of these jobs puts them in an antagonistic relationship with the rest of us. Take the landlord. Landlords own your home. They own your home because they have more money than you. If someone already has more money than you, you have to pay them for a place to stay. Now, I could see the fairness in that if you were paying the people who built your place, but there is a 100% chance that wasn't your landlord. Your landlord owns your place because they have so much money, they can afford to own their own and someone else's home, and you can't even afford your own. They will kick you out of the small space you occupy if you don't pay the tribute they demand. So what would it mean to be a good landlord? If they gave up being a landlord. If they gave you the home you've been living in, eliminating the incentives they had to screw you over, making you equals. The only good landlord is no landlord. A good person should not be someone you fear. It shouldn't be someone who can kick you out of your house because you don't have enough money, or fire you and snatch your income away. A boss is someone who makes more money than you, tells you what to do, monitors your behavior, and threatens you with poverty if you don't do everything as expected. Sure, they might be nice, friendly, have a beer with you, but to a boss, you are always just a means to an end. You're entirely disposable, interchangeable with other job seekers. If you're pregnant, injured, sick, or grieving, the boss only wants to know when you'll be ready to work again. We learn from a young age to fear punishment from an authority. What makes them an authority? Their job, the seat they occupy, puts the entire enforcement apparatus of the state behind them. If the landlord evicts you, if the boss fires you, if you're not a paying customer, either you leave immediately or the police will be called to remove you. Property rights are the only rights that matter, and you don't have them. The police like to indoctrinate children into thinking they're the good guys, your friendly neighborhood officer who keeps you safe from the bad guys. Then we grow up and realize cops don't have to keep you safe, that their job is to impose the will of the ruling class on us and keep the money flowing upwards. If you dig deeper, you might blame the police for most of our social problems, because they defend our rulers from us as they kill, plunder, enslave, and destroy nature. The police are the single greatest obstacle to freedom. And defunding them would not change that because their core purpose and functions would remain the same. Abolishing the police would make it possible for people to resist the exercise of power over others. 
But if we want to abolish cops, landlords, bosses, and unicorns, what do we replace them with? Short answer, nothing. After all, having a landlord means paying someone else so you can live in your place. I mean, you can call a plumber yourself. Let's cut out the middleman. Some people squat and refuse to leave or engage in rent strikes. Many people live in cooperative housing or some form of communal home. These strategies will become necessary for more and more people as home ownership becomes more concentrated and out of reach for more people. What about the boss? Aren't they essential? Well, do you need someone else making all the decisions about your work? Do you need someone monitoring you all the time? Do you need the carrot of promotions and raises dangled in front of you and the stick of someone threatening to take your livelihood away if you don't follow all the rules or work fast enough? Corporations are structured for control. The job of the boss is to maintain the discipline the owners of the corporation demand. If employees had control over their own workplaces, they might structure them horizontally. So that if you contribute something, you get a say in the decisions. If they have teams, it might make sense to have team leaders, but as ad hoc positions, not for everything forever. We need organization to get complicated things done, but we don't need bosses. And the police? Is it possible to abolish police and avoid plunging into chaos? Well, you could ask millions of people around the world who don't live under the thumb of police. Many communities have no need of formal organization because people take care of each other as a matter of course. In larger societies, however, people form community-based organizations accountable to the people who live there. They can provide rapid response, maybe one group to stop violence and another for mental health crises. Some organizations build homes and distribute food and other goods so that people aren't cold, hungry, addicted, homeless or in an abusive home, and forced to resort to theft and violence. They might counsel and check up on people, provide spaces and host events for everyone so we're less isolated and more like a community, and so less likely to hurt each other. If you want to learn more, I recommend the work of Mariam Kaba. But until we abolish the relationships that give rise to cops, landlords, and bosses, some people will continue to insist there are good ones. How about this? As skeptical people, we won't close our minds to the possibility such people exist. We'll keep searching for the good cops, landlords, and bosses with the same effort we've been searching for the unicorn. Until we find one, however, we should probably spend our time creating a world without them. Thanks.